Have you ever seen one of those uh, shows on television where they uh, feature a expedition where they're searching for lost treasure? You know, in the Gulf or out in the Atlantic Ocean or somewhere. We probably all have seen them before. And uh, they're, they're kind of interesting. They, uh, you know, show that, uh, you know, they always show usually that they found some type of lost treasure. But what we see on TV is really just the end result, isn't it? For in reality, there was a lot that went into that expedition. Many months probably prior to them filming that and doing the actual exploration, there was something that went on behind the scenes. Someone first had to have the vision that, yes, there actually is buried treasure. Now that meant they had probably to do some research. They didn't just go out and start riding around in the Gulf of Mexico or the Caribbean somewhere hoping they're going to accidentally run across something. They're going to, they're going to look at historical navigational charts. They're going to study history. They're going to go through all the stories that they, maybe they've heard. And then they think they're going to be able to at least pinpoint an area. Then they have to gather together all the equipment that it takes to do the research. It's not that something you just kind of look in the water and say, oh yeah, there's the ship. You know, they get sonar equipment. And sometimes they have to get special submarines and mechanical arms and all this stuff. And then they have to learn to scuba dive and all that. So a lot of work has gone up to that 60-minute special that they show there on the National Geographic channel or whatever it might be. What motivated them, what kept them at the task, it was simply the vision of finding that buried treasure. Those gold coins, those silver plates, whatever it might be that they're searching for, buried many feet below the surface of the ocean. It's the vision of the end result that keeps them doing and what causes them to do all the work leading up to that. Well, as we begin this new year, I want to challenge us to think about what could be. I want us to think about what God can do what he has done and what is out there still. Because see, God is not finished with us yet. He's not finished with us as individuals in our own lives. He's not finished with us as a church. It's, it's good to reflect back and it's good to give God the glory. This, the 2013, just let me uh, uh, share with you and, and thank you for your faithfulness. 2013 was a record year for Anchor. As I look through the historical records, there's three years we don't have figures for, but of the years that we have, we set an all-time attendance record for a Anchor here, averaging 235 across the year. That's with the uh, ebbs and flows of the uh, season and non-season. But the uh, closest that, that we've come to that, uh, it was 1992 when Anchor averaged 223. So God has blessed us with um, new people. He's blessed us with uh, new opportunities this past year in the area of just the attendance. We were able to expand our Bible school class offerings. We have three adult classes, and we also, this summer, decided we need to expand and double our kids' classes. When I came, we had one kids' class, and then we added two. And this year, we have four classes for young people from first grade up through high school. And God has blessed that. We have had a good year. And I'd like to say that God has blessed us in spite of ourselves. You ever felt that way? Because you look at your, yourselves and the things that I've done wrong and others have done, you know, it's like God's blessed us in spite of ourselves. But you know what? There's still so much that we have yet to discover. There's still so much that God can do. And it's that vision of what God can do, what He has in store for us, that I believe gives us the motivation for doing what it takes to prepare for that. You see, our vision, we need to be driven by the vision. Uh, the vision statement that we have here in Anchor is to be a healthy congregation or a healthy church that ministers to the multiple generations of Southwest Florida. Now what is unique about that vision? Well, it's unique in this. Every vision should have, every church should have a unique vision. That you take in assessment the resources that you have and the area that you live in and what is available and what is there. And then what could it be? 
Why should we be a healthy church that reaches the multiple generations of Southwest Florida? Because God has placed us in a unique position here at Anchor. We have many people, as you're aware or well of, that are retired. Some have been retired for many years. Some are brand new retirees moving down to this area. And we need to be ready to minister to the needs of that generation. And, and tap from the wealth, untold wealth of experience and wisdom and resources that are there. That is a valuable asset. But another interesting thing I just heard on the news this week that Florida's great rate of growth, not just people moving in, but is higher than the fastest growing nations in the world. There are more families and more kids coming in to this area. The high school where my daughter attends, Estero High School, has 2,000 high school students. The elementary school, the middle school here in Benita, they're experiencing growth. So, what it means is that we need to have a vision that we are a church that reaches all generations and brings together the wisdom and the wealth and the experience so that we can minister to the families that God is sending our way. It's a challenge. It takes a lot of work. But the vision is worth it to see what God can do with multiple generations in an area that's blessed with multiple generations. So, I want to challenge us to think about what God can do. Here's some things that, that uh, we're talking about doing this year here at the church. One of the things is that uh, we're continually trying to always upgrade our facilities. Last year here we had a drive to raise money and we replaced the air conditioning system. None of you have seen that air conditioning. I haven't seen anybody crawl up into the, uh, the attic above the hallways here and check out that new air conditioning system. But you know what? You're all going to benefit from that. You'll feel it, won't you? The portico out here, maybe you've seen that, uh, is a beautiful blessing to have that. To be able to have a dry roof over us and all the new pavers and expanded that area, a larger area. We like to, to keep up. This year we're trying to get new chairs. Okay, The chairs that we sit in have done well for 15, 20 years. But uh, we want to get some that don't have the metal runners on the side that uh, are cushioned all the way across. And uh, the uh, they'll look a little better. These have been cleaned and cleaned and cleaned and some of them just need to be thrown out just to be honest with you you can't clean them anymore we're trying to do that to upgrade but more important than just the physical stuff we're going to put together a training program for leaders that we will raise up new leaders in his church because a church is essential to have strong leaders we have four training sessions for those that that may be raised up to be leaders we're going to try to have a facility usage team. We've already put that together to evaluate how we use our facilities, how we maximize in our Bible school program. Unless we start classes during the 8 o'clock hour, in the 9.30 and 11 o'clock hour, we do not have one square inch of classroom space where we could add another class even if we wanted to. So how do you deal with that? We're going to have a team start looking at some of those things. So. God has placed before us some opportunities, some vision. And all these things must be built upon the foundation of faithfulness that has gone before us, that we have currently, and based on the vision of what God can do. So this morning, I'm starting a new sermon series. It's called Cross Training. Cross training. Now you may be familiar with that term, you may not. It's an athletic term and cross training is a term that's used to refer to what athletes do in order to get ready to make themselves as strong as possible. Cross training is a training that involves exercising in different ways to try to get the total body ready for the event that it's going to participate in. Cross training is important. See, if you only exercise one group of muscles, then you're not going to be, for example, if I was, a, say, say a pro football player, I won't say if I was a pro football player because that's stretching your imagination too far. You can't see that, all right? But imagine a pro football player that says, I want strong biceps and he decided he was going to do curls and that's all he did he exercised those biceps that's all the only and he has huge arms 
That may be great, but if he's not exercised any other parts of his body, he's not going to have the stamina to run 20 yards down the, to the field and tackle the guy with those huge arms. It does no good just to exercise one area. That's what cross training is. It's getting the total body ready for the event that the athlete is going to participate in. Well, what is cross training in the spiritual sense? It really has very little to do with building your biceps or getting that body ready. But Jesus said, take up my cross and follow me. I want us to cross train. I want us to prepare ourselves to take up his cross and to be the person that he wants us to be. So we're going to talk about cross training. And we're going to talk about uh, what that means. That verse that you see up there in the larger context is from the Apostle Paul to in the book of Ephesians chapter 4. Let me read 11 and 12 together. It says, It was He who gave some to be apostles, some to be prophets, some to be evangelists, and some to be pastors and teachers, to prepare God's people for works of service, so that the body of Christ may be built up and be strong. So this morning, what I want us to focus on today is simply this. Eat right and exercise more. Have you ever heard that? Do you know that uh, Americans spend $20 billion a year on all the different things involved with weight loss? That includes the diet books, the diet drugs, the weight loss surgery. Doesn't include even the money spent on the apparel because you've got to look good in order to work out, right? So I can save Americans $20 billion if they just do this thing. Eat right, exercise more. And it's sound, solid, foundational advice. And it works. But I'm not going to talk, I'm not, I'm not going to run a physical training course here. We're not going to challenge you all to use 40 pounds. But when it comes to your spiritual life, we need to eat right and exercise more. And that what I want us, that's what I want us to think about. What does that mean spiritually? What, does the, the Bible even address something like that? Well, let's look first at this thing, eating right. What am I talking about? Am I going to get you uh, depressed about what you ate for breakfast? No, okay? Because I would not have passed very well this morning. I stopped at 7-Eleven and got a sausage biscuit and a blueberry muffin, all right? Now, it was good, but it probably wasn't the healthiest thing that I could have uh, put in my body if I was going to eat right physically. But spiritually, what is it that God wants us to do? In Hebrews chapter 5, verses 13 through 14, he, he says these words, and they're interesting words because we can all relate to them. He says, anyone who lives on milk, being still an infant, is not acquainted with the teachings about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. We all understand that a baby has milk, but eventually that baby has to get off that milk in order to be strong. And he says, spiritually, too many times we stay on just the milk. We, we don't go beyond it. If we never get off of just memorizing John 3.16, great verse. But if you never go beyond that in your life, in your spiritual walk, you're not growing, maturing as a spiritual being in our relationship with God. And he uses in that verse the word train. He said, by, but solid food is for the mature who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil. The word train there is that Greek word that they use to describe the athletes. And if you know anything about Greek history and the Olympics and all of that, it grew out of that culture. They were the ones that first had the idea of training and preparing themselves for games and for athletic competition. That's the word that the writer of Hebrews uses. 
That, that word that's rich in the whole concept of getting yourself ready. And it says, by constant use, have trained themselves. And then he goes on and talks about distinguishing between good and evil. And the writer of Hebrew goes on and, and talks about growing in our faith and distinguishing what is right and wrong. It means to exercise totally. It means spiritually as well as physically cross-train. Saw a picture or a poster one time in the library. It said this. It said, exercise it all, mind and body. And I would add to that, exercise it all, mind, body, and spirit. As we try to go forward, to capture the vision that God has in store for us. Now one of the questions I want to ask when I get to heaven is this. God, why is it so easy to put on weight and so hard to take it off? You ever wondered that? It just doesn't seem fair, does it? You know, you can put on five pounds by just, you know, walking by food sometimes. But boy, to get rid of that, it's hard to do. Well, training is hard work. Training is hard work. And many times... We only see the end result of that. The Olympics start next month, the Winter Olympics. And we will see skiing, we will see ice skating, and we'll see bobsledding, and then that, that very athletic sport of curling, all right, to, to where you slide that stone down the ice. I doubt if those people train as hard physically as those that are doing the skiing or the, uh, uh, you know, the figure skating and all of that. But godly training... Hopefully, the end result is that we are stronger in the Word. That we have eaten right. That we have fed ourselves that which builds us up. See, here are some dietary supplements that you can add if you don't have this as a part of your training program for growing spiritually. What I'd encourage you to, to get into Bible school class. We have two classes offered at the 930 hour. One meets in the, the uh, Fellowship Center. Byron Black teaches that, the standard lesson. And uh, the other class meets is in the, the educational building, the first modular over there. And that's led by Dennis Smirtka. It's based on some videos and there's a discussion time. But both of those get us into the Word. That's important. I'd encourage you to, uh, to get in Bible school. We're going to start a men's Bible study on, Monday, on Tuesday mornings, I believe, uh, this week. There's a ladies' Bible study at Tuesday mornings also, same time. And uh, that's a way to grow, to feed yourself spiritually. It's always good to read Christian books, to lead, listen to Christian speakers, and all of those things. But we need to consciously, consciously make that effort. I've thought about losing weight. A lot of good thoughts. But guess what? Laying on the couch thinking about that isn't going to get it done. While I'm eating the caramel corn my daughter got me for Christmas. All right? There's something wrong with that picture. Well, sometimes it takes a conscious decision. A conscious act. A commitment that I'm going to do what it takes. So, feed yourself this year. You're not going to get everything you need on a steady diet, even if you come to church every Sunday. Imagine if you only ate one meal a week. That wouldn't work very well. Same spiritually. I'd encourage you through the week. Maybe the next week I'm going to talk about it even more in more detail. So the, the, the message next week is digging deeper. So I won't go into all of that, but uh, there are some ways that, that are very easy to, to dig deeper into God's Word. So, eat right, exercise more. Don't we all just love exercise? Stretch and flex. It's important that you prepare your body for that. Well, this second thing in Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, he says this. It says, no discipline seems pleasant at the time, but painful. Later on, however, it produces the harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. There it is again, that word trained. Now, the larger context of this passage, the writer of Hebrews is giving us the illustration of how a father disciplines his children. And through that discipline, it shapes and directs a child to do the right thing. And that God at times disciplines us and that we are shaped and given direction in our lives. 
But I want us to think about that whole concept of getting ready, of exercising, of training ourselves, and, and being disciplined, maybe in our own way, where we have to be self-disciplined to do these things. We need to exercise. Paul Harvey, you've heard of him, you remember him. When facing hard times, he said this. He said, in times like these, it is always helpful to remember that there have always been times like these. In times like these, it's always helpful to remember that there's always been times like these. And in this context, the writer of Hebrews is trying to encourage the Christians then and trying to encourage us now that life is not going to always be easy. There's going to th have things come up in life that challenge us, that cause us to evaluate, that causes us to, to think about what it means to be a Christian, that causes us to think about what it is to step out on faith. And sometimes resistance it's one of those things. We've all seen an eagle fly, I imagine. You can see them every now and then down here. We're out near the water. We actually had one fly over our house one time. Now what's interesting is that they have said that the only obstacle to making, letting an eagle fly, fly faster, the only resistance he ever receives is the air. If he could slice through that air a little bit faster. But on the other hand, if you put an eagle in a large building that was vacuumed with no air, he couldn't fly at all. Because as an eagle flies or as an airplane flies, as anything flies, it's the resistance against the wind that actually causes you to fly. Airplanes, look at their wings sometime, you may know this, the bottom of the airplane is flat, the top of the airplane wing is always rounded. Without that rounded contour on the top of that wing, a plane could not fly. Because as it goes through that air and it hits that wing, it causes an updraft. And it's that updraft that brings the plane off the ground. It's impossible to fly without the resistance of the wind. Many times obstacles come in our lives and sometimes those obstacles are the very things that help us overcome, that help us to get stronger. And it's tough work sometimes getting through those. In the South for many years the major crop was cotton. Cotton was king. You may have heard that phrase. Until there was this little critter that came across the Mexican border called the bow weevil. The bow weevil came across the south and basically decimated most of the cotton industry in the south. They've recovered from that a little bit. You can still drive through Georgia, Alabama and still see cotton fields. But when the boll weevil destroyed the cotton fields, what happened? Well, it caused the farmers to explore new, new ways, and they found that their soil was really good for peanuts, and that they could grow soybeans. And what happened is that many of the farmers switched to those crops to survive, but they found they could make a lot more money making corn, or uh, uh, I'm thinking of Illinois, corn and soybeans, uh, soybeans and peanuts, rather than cotton. The challenge before them caused them to reevaluate. It caused them to grow. What about our lives? None of us like going through tough times. But sometimes exercising through those tough times is essential. Someone wrote these observations about those who uh, had lived before us. He said, bury a man in the snows of Valley Forge and you have George Washington. Raise him in subject poverty, and you have Abraham Lincoln. Strike him down with infantile paralysis and becomes a Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Burn him so severely that the doctors say he will never walk again, and you have a Glenn Cunningham who set the world record for the mile in 1934. Call him a slow learner and retarded and write him off as uneducatable, and you have an Albert Einstein. 
part of our training as godly men and women comes from learning that hard times and hard lessons helps us stretch and causes us to grow. And what is the end result? In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 11, it's this. It produces a harvest of righteousness and a peace for those who have been trained by it. It produces a harvest of righteousness and peace for those who have been trained by it. Cross training may at times stretch us, but it's sometimes during those times of stretching that we grow the strongest. There's one final thing in cross training. And it's maybe the thing that, that, that gets in the way the most for any time we start into an exercise routine or a dieting routine. And it's called focus. It's focus. In order to do these things, you've got to stay focused, don't you? You've got to stay on task. A part of, important part of training is focus. They say that animal trainers, and you've probably seen this, the Barnum and Bailey Circus is going on in Germain Arena if you uh, want to find something to do. Um, and you've probably maybe seen the lion trainers. I've only been to the Barnum and Bailey one time in my life. But uh, you've seen it on TV if you've never seen it in person. They many times would take a stool with, uh, in, in with a whip and a stool. The lion trainers would take that into the cage where the lions were. And I never thought about it before, but why a stool? You know, if I was in there with a lion, I think I'd want a shotgun. You know, something, something more effective. Why do they take that stool and that whip in there with them? Well, they say the reason they take that stool, and if you notice, they're always pointing the legs at the lion. They say what happens is that that lion tries to focus on all four of those legs. And when he tries to focus on all the four of those things, it throws off his thought processes and they are able to direct him because the lion basically is distracted from what he would normally be doing. That's an interesting concept. I've never talked to a lion to see if that really works. Don't ever plan on trying it out myself. Ding dong. That's our computer waking us up. That was the signal. But sometimes... We get so easily distracted. We get so easily distracted that we can't accomplish what it is God has put into us to accomplish. So my challenge to you, and my challenge to myself, is to stay focused. Stay focused and let's be trained to bear the cross. Let's be trained to be strong in the Word. To be strong in our faith. To be able to walk and do the things that God has called us to do. It's worth it. For you see, there's a great treasure in the end. And it's not buried in the ocean. It's paved with streets of gold. Let's cross train for the reward that He has prepared for us. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for loving us. I thank you for blessing us. And Lord, as we begin a new year here as a church, as individuals, I pray that you will strengthen us and encourage us, Lord. Pray that we will do what it takes to uh, be better prepared for you and your kingdom. It's in Jesus' name we pray.